Hi, in this series of videos we're going to be making some cabinets specifically for a miter saw station. Now you might remember in the past that I've actually made a miter saw station before. However, at the time I did kind of rush it, it was a very hot week and I didn't think a lot of things through. It was my first time really making proper cabinets and I cut a few corners where I shouldn't have. I've had a lot more time to think about how I use the miter saw station, what sort of storage I need in the workshop and just in general how to make it better. And this series is sponsored by Craig. Craig have provided a lot of cabinet making tools from a pocket hole jig to the miter saw precision track system that we'll be covering in a future episode. In this episode we're going to be breaking down the sheet goods and making the base cabinets. As you can see there are some coloured cut lists that I'll be using today and there'll be plans available at the end of the series. Before we start cutting it's a good time to talk about materials. These cabinets are going to be made out of melamine or specifically 16mm HMR melamine. Melamine when described as a sheet is chipboard with a melamine coating on both sides. For cabinetry in particular melamine is great. It's very inexpensive, you don't need to finish it and it holds up more than well enough. And that's the key thing. Yeah plywood might look a bit nicer in certain circumstances but you've got to add time and money to finishing. The cost of plywood is easily twice what the cost of a sheet of melamine is and that's just for pine plywood not cabinet grade. And as long as you make the cabinet properly which isn't that hard but we'll get into that a little bit later. The melamine holds up just fine. It's, it's quite a hard layer so it's very durable but it's also very easy to clean which in a wood shop is great because it highlights the sawdust but it also means sweeping it up is a lot easier than unfinished plywood. So the next thing to talk about is the tooling. This is not going to be a minimal tools build but I'll try and provide a alternative for the more expensive machines. In this case I'm using a track saw because I don't have a circular saw. This is my only circular saw and it does a great job. 16 mil thick sheet of melamine weighs in at I want to say 25 kilos. It's not a light sheet to be pushing through the table saw so it's much easier to break it down ahead of time. If you don't have a track saw you can make your own tracks and I'll have links in the description below. Craig also have the Craig grip cut which attaches to your circular saw and gives you a wider guide. For each cut first I did a scoring cut about three millimeters deep. This helps prevent any chip out on the melamine. Then I do a full cut through the sheet. Note that I have a sheet of MDF underneath this sheet acting as a buffer between the sheets of melamine. With melamine it's important to clamp the tracks down. The grippers just slide around. Things are broken down according to the cut list. I like to label each piece as I make the cut. As I'm working by myself it can sometimes be a bit of a challenge to get the buffer piece of MDF underneath to the next layer of melamine. This is really the best method I could come up with. Once the sheets were broken down into more manageable chunks I cut them down further at the table saw trying to group all the same size dimensions so I didn't need to reset the fence. If you don't have a table saw a circular saw and track will still work it will just take longer. Finally I ripped down the buffer pieces of MDF to use for the cabinet backs. If we look at this cabinet here I've got it assembled but I'm going to have to pull this apart. Before assembly we want to put on the edge banding for the melamine so you can see it looks somewhat better. And the reason we need to do this before assembly is that all of our trimming tools are going to have treble actually trimming into the corners can't get into that corner there so you're going to be left with quite a big chunk. If you've never edge banded before we'll go through some of the basics. There are quite a few different types but in general for a hobbyist you're going to be looking at iron on edge banding. Comes in a roll, you can get this roll, well, I've got this roll of bunning so most home centres are going to have them. And as I said this is iron on edge banding which means that it has an adhesive layer which is heat activated so you need an iron. Any iron will do. You're not actually getting in contact with the sticky side so it's not going to gum up the surface of your iron and you need to set that to hot and dry or cotton setting. So oversize your piece of edge banding just a little and we can iron that on. Then we need to trim that off. Now you can just break it but you do run a bit of a risk of splitting it further. I'm using these flush cut trimmers from Fastcap. They're good, they're, they work fine. Now I'm going to come back and apply a bit more pressure, a bit more heat, particularly along the 
very ends because they're often the spot that will get the least amount of heat and pressure. Then generally you'd come back with a roller. I don't have a roller. It's for some reason opted not to pick one up. So just a block of wood help put some pressure on. That makes sure that the adhesive bonds to the wood properly. Uh, the edge banding will always be wider than the material you're gluing it onto. Otherwise you'd have to be very, very precise. So this is fairly typical stuff. It is 22 millimeters. And I'm working with 16 mil millimeter. So I need to trim that up. This is a, another tool from FastCut. This is the quad trimmer, I think they're called. It's basically two sets of razor blades. Uh, and this will hug the, the material and trim it off. There are other methods. A flush trim plane can do it. It is a bit slower, a bit trickier. You can use power tools as well. A trim router is a good example. This sort of trimmer works pretty well. I'm not gonna say it's perfect. I'm still learning to use it myself, but it works pretty well. It's a little groove in there, which you put over the edge banding. You squeeze and then ribbons of melamine tape come off. Now that's done a pretty good job, though the corners are still sharp. So once again, I'm using a fast cap product. This is the fast break. Basically it's a chamfer plane, but instead of having a blade in there, it's got sandpaper. As you can see, I've been using that today. I find that the sandpaper does gum up pretty quickly on this. So you do have to do a bit more sanding than what they advertise at one swipe, but that then breaks these edges on 45 degree angle. Doesn't end up touching the face, which is good. We don't want to scuff that up and use a smoother feel with no edges to catch on. And for the joinery for these cabinets, we're going to be using pocket holes, specifically the Craig pocket hole jig. This is the K4, part of the K4 master system. If you've never seen pocket holes before, jigs like this help you hold the workpiece in, let you drill the pocket hole, and a pocket hole looks like that. It's basically, well, it's a hole for the screw to go in. Use a particular type of screw, which has a nice chunky head on it, which sits in that pocket. That will then pull the workpiece nice and tight up against what you're trying to screw it into. Pocket holes really shine with cabinetry. The placement of the pockets lets you create joins that generally don't get seen. For example, you can have them on the top rails or the outside of the inner cabinets so that you can never actually see the joinery. The K4 comes with, well, the K4 and this special stepped drill bit. This gives the pilot hole for the actual screw and the flatter step for the head of the screw. The jig has steel bushings for the drill bit to go into and the stop on the drill, well, stops it before it drills through the jig and rotting your material. If you're doing pocket hole joinery, I also highly recommend getting the vacuum attachment. The K4 comes with one. I had to buy a little adapter to go to that, but it makes such a massive difference. There is no cleanup afterwards, and it makes the whole process a lot quicker because you're not having to uh, pull all the material out, all the debris, and you're also not having to fight registration if the workpiece goes there, but there's uh, sawdust there, it might tip up, that sort of thing. I've got my drill bit collar set to the appropriate size, which is on the uh, pocket hole jig itself, which makes sure that I don't go through my material. I've got a side of the cabinet that will hold up the miter saw. It needs to be a little bit more reinforced and there'll be some other reinforcement I add later. And I'd have to do that no matter what type of joinery I use on the cabinet. So the method for this is exactly the same as all the other cabinets, but the placement's just a little bit different. All right, it is time for assembly. Now, last week I made these corner blocks. These work pretty well, but they would work much better with uh, quick grip clamps. I don't have any. So I've been using these to help set up, removing them, then putting on larger F clamps. It is important to clamp everything together, particularly on melamine, uh, because when you're driving the screw, it's gonna push the other piece out of the way. Craig do sell some 90 degree clamps, I think they call them, that sit in the pockets of the pocket holes, and they're really good for tightening up those joints. Unfortunately, I don't have any, and when I went to buy some, they were out of stock. So these are pocket hole screws. Sometimes they'll also be known as face frame screws. 
uh, washer head screws, cheese head screws, lots of different names for the same thing, but they've basically got an integrated washer, a large head on them if they're a cheese head screw, and they're, they're not countersunk, they don't need to be. In fact, you don't want them to be so that they can pull the two pieces tight. Because this is melamine, not plywood or solid wood, we're using coarse threaded screws rather than fine threaded screws. For this size uh, cabinet, or this size material I should say, we're using 25 mil or one inch screws. Uh, you can go a little bit larger, but you don't want to go so large that it pokes out the other side. These particular ones and most pocket hole screws actually are square head or Robertson drive. So the Craig jig comes with a Robertson drive bit. So are we just screwing this together? Yes and no. You can get away with just using screws. Gluing it certainly isn't going to hurt. The only downside to gluing is that it's going to be a little bit more expensive because you've got to buy the glue. But it is also going to make these um, very permanent. You're not going to be able to unscrew the pieces and use them later on. Not necessarily a downside for stronger cabinets. Now if you are going to use glue and you're using melamine, you need to use a melamine glue. So I've got Titebond's melamine glue. Uh, there are plenty of other brands. This happened to be easily purchasable online in a small quantity. This is white, dries clear, and as I said, adds a lot of strength. This type of glue is typically good for gluing melamine to a porous surface. So that would be the edges of the chipboard onto the smooth surface. You can of course use solid wood onto the smooth melamine surface, but regular wood glue won't actually stick to the melamine. It will sort of stick to itself, but it's easy to peel off. It's time to attach the back. There are a lot of different ways that you can do backs on cabinets. Uh, I'm going to go with MDF. This happens to be 6mm MDF. Uh, you could use plywood. So 6mm plywood. You could paint this because it's a garage cabinet. I'm not bothered by seeing the MDF at the back. Or you could use melamine. So you could either have a full sheet of melamine on the back or insert into here and then pocket hole into the frame. Uh, those methods will add more strength, but again, it's all about whether it's necessary to have that strength. I've found for these sort of cabinets, any sort of material will add enough strength that they suddenly stop racking. And then when you screw them all together and weigh them down, they're actually very strong structures. This is very similar to how you make a bookcase nice and strong. For this, I'm going to glue it down and add nails. I've got a brad nailer. If you don't have a nail gun, you can still hammer in nails with a hammer. If you don't want to do that, screws will work too. Uh, you just need to be careful of your placements. The plinths were also made for melamine, though to get the long joints, I had to join two tracks together. Cross cutting of these pieces was done using a stop block on my table saw sled. The plinths are joined together with pocket hole screws with the inner support not touching the ground. There are lots of different ways to level out the plinths. Uh, for example, you can use these sort of snap wedges, you can make your own, where you insert them in, snap them off so that the excess doesn't show. You can also use adjustable feet, but they tend to be a little bit more expensive uh, and depending on the floor may not have enough travel. Uh, another way is to scribe, sort of level it with the spaces and then scribe the cabinet to match the floor. And that's a process of basically just tracing the contour of the floor onto the cabinets so that you then cut that down and it drops onto the floor perfectly level in place. I've opted not to go with scribing because it's not something I've done before and I don't really care about these visible gaps. It's workshop cabinets after all. The floor here is pretty awful. It slopes away from the door for some reason and towards the walls. Uh, and the slope is quite extreme. We've got 20 mil gap at that end while it's touching at the other end. So I ended up buying a bucket of spaces. This is the handy shim bucket. It was about $16 I think from Bunnings range of shims from 10 millimeters all the way down to one millimeter. So you need to level them in two directions. So a short level is good for that sort of direction. And then a much longer level for going in this direction. And because these will be eventually one connected set of cabinets, 
you need to level the whole lot in one plane. Uh, and that's why I've screwed on this temporary block here to keep everything in one plane. I'm not just using the shims, I've used them to keep me level and then I'm using these blocks, they're just random blocks of melamine, to take the weight, uh, to transfer the weight so it's um, not just on the shims. The shims themselves are rated quite high, they would work quite well too, but it doesn't hurt to have some extra insurance. You'll notice that this isn't exactly leveled at the top, it doesn't have to be, just want this to fall down on the ground so that it sort of matches that profile. That's it for this episode. As you can see, the cabinets are in place, but they're not attached to the plinth or to each other. The top is done, except for the scribing, so it sits flush up against the wall, and there's nothing actually in the cabinets. This is part one in a series of videos, so be sure to like, share, subscribe, all those things so you don't miss out on the next part. The next part will be in a few days time, uh, covering the shelf pin jig and how to, well, put shelf pins in for adjustable shelves. Following that up, we will have drawers, uh, how to make drawers, how to mount drawers, and maybe doors. I'm not certain on the scheduling of doors just yet. At the start of the episode, I said that making cabinets is not all that difficult, and that's not meant as a dig at professional cabinet makers, but these sort of cabinets are just big boxes. They're not incredibly difficult structures, but the difference between a professional and a hobbyist is mostly time. A professional will do it much, much quicker. A hobbyist, you're much better at being slower at it, getting it right the first time, than having to pull everything apart or start from scratch. If there's something that you feel like I skipped over or didn't cover in enough detail, leave a comment below and I'll get to it later in the series. Thanks for watching.